good morning, afternoon. My clock says it's 7.30, so we'll go with that. Um, yeah, uh, I've been invited back to be your token ops troll under the bridge. Um, serverlessness is apparently about um, kids who don't have to worry about things like hardware, and that's cool. I don't like hardware either. Um, I went to this first serverless conf, and I told them I was going to be throwing tomatoes, and they said that's fine. They brought me anyway. So hmm, let's do this again. Um, I have some new trolls to add to the collection of My Little Ponies. So don't say I didn't do anything for you. Um, honestly, if you skip a bunch of the articles that are out there, um, you, start, you start seeing all these really obnoxious little quotes about how no ops is coming and how, um, you know, it's just so hard for software engineers to have to think about what happens to their code after they hit push. It's so hard. Um, believe me, I empathize. Um, so in the glorious future, uh, nobody has to ever think about these things. I really hate the term, the term serverless. I really preferred functions as a service. I thought that was appropriate. Did not make me angry, but things that make me angry usually don't make money. <laughs> um, I just got done being mad about DevOps, so I'm a little mad that now I have to be mad about another term, but whatever. Um, so as far as I can tell, serverless is basically just a rebranding for APIs and platforms, which, you know, I like those things, so I'm on board. Um, also, it's kind of just like the latest version of capitalism and technology, where greater complexity leads to greater specialization. So, you know, we outsource as much as we can and pay people to, pay people to have those problems so that we don't have to have them because engineering cycles are always going to be the scarcest resource that anyone has. <laughs> eh. So, serverlessness is a lie. It's turtles all the way down. That's fine, right? It's just an abstraction. We like abstractions. Um, as long as it's um, as long as it's helping more than it's harming. So uh, let me tell you a little bit about myself and my background, um, and then we can have some real talk about the trade-offs and the myths. Um, when you should serverless and when you should not. I am fairly opinionated about this, um, and some traps for the unwary. Uh, my name is Charity. Um, like the nice gentleman said, I'm a co-founder of a new startup called Honeycomb, where we're working on observability uh, for new and emerging architectures. If you want a demo, come find me afterwards. I'm super happy to show it off. And before this, I did a little bit of everything, but most recently, I worked at Parse. Anyone here ever use Parse? Oh my god, only like two? Jesus Christ. No mobile developers here? No mobile? What do you guys do? Real work. And why are you at the fucking fucking conference? Jesus. <laughs> All right. Well, Parse was my baby, right? Parse. I was the first infrastructure hire at Parse, and we had um, and we got acquired by Facebook a couple years ago, and we had a million years ago when they shut. We had a million years ago. God, my brain is like, what the fuck are you doing to me? It's seven o'clock. Uh, we had a million apps that were running on Parse when Facebook shut us down. Um, or they're shutting us down at the first of the year. I have feelings about that. Um, but Parse was a backend as a service, as they were calling it, right? Um, there was infrastructure as a service that was AWS, and there was backend as a service, which was like a slightly higher level abstraction. And serverlessness, I feel like I can legitimately say that I was doing serverless before it was cool, because you know we would handle, we handled everything. We handled all the storage. We did push, push notifications. Uh, we did. Um, <laughs> JavaScript hosted in the cloud, you know, functions of the service, whatever. Um, I really love platforms. I really love solving these problems at scale. And so you can see that I'm coming from the producer side of serverless. I am identifying with the people who are running Lambda under the hood very heavily. And this makes me really want to help because I have seen the shit that people push to production every day. And I can tell so much about what they know and what they've done um, just by looking at the code that they pushed into cloud code or by the queries that they're trying to run in my fucking Mongo replica sets where they're doing like nested full table scans. You're like, have you ever even seen a query? <laughs> like I saw people build apps on parse that would 10x and 10x and 10x and 10x um, in the middle of the night. You know, they get featured on the iTunes store and blow up, and nothing bad would ever happen. 
um, because they knew how to build things with very basic, you know, software engineering tenets, even when they didn't have great visibility to stuff under the hood. And I saw on the flip side the much more common scenario where I ended up auto throttling them because they were taking up all of the resources on a very complex multi tenant system. And I kept telling people, like, for your own sake, this isn't about me, I'll just throttle your ass. I don't give a shit. For your own sake, like, you should know some things about how this works under the hood. But services are magical pixie dust, right? Where you can throw money at it to make them go faster. <laughs> Spoiler alert <laughs> services are not magical pixie dust. Um, now, at Parse, this was kind of a marketing thing because we told everybody it was magical pixie dust. This is not my decision. But they were just like, yeah, we have one of the greatest engineering teams in the world, you know, bring it. And I'm like, stop, stop, you know. Okay, yes, yeah, so I understand this is great marketing. Um, and we do have a great engineering team. Um, but if we tell people, you don't have to think about your indexing. You don't have to think about your schemas. You don't have to think about your backoffs and your retries. Um, your thundering herd problems. Uh, people loved us up to a point. And then they really didn't. <laughs> and I couldn't really blame them, right? They're... They wrote some stupid thing, you know, where they're scanning everything, and it worked great for a thousand objects in the database. And then they had a thousand and one. And then they're tweeting at us angrily, parses down. I'm like, no, it's not. <laughs> I have very beautiful graphs that tell me the parse is fine. You're not fine. <laughs> That's when you start. Uh, yeah. Oh, oh, God, and the things where they just like click um, and it would like chain a bunch of HTTP requests serially out to the internet on a thing that has like a five second timeout. Anyway, services are not magical pixie dust and it's not like we're perfect either, but operations is, this is a contract, right, between you and me. If I'm running your infrastructure, whether I sit next to you or whether you're paying me to sit across the world from you, um, this is a shared responsibility, right? Operations is a shared, it's a living document, much like the US Constitution is supposed to be. It's constantly changing. Um, and spoiler alert, you can't get five nines of serverless, ever. I mean, not to like mislead you, you probably can't get five nines without serverless. <laughs> but just to be clear, you have less control over whether you get five nines or not with serverless. Um, a few of the things that we will briefly touch on in this talk. The best code is no code. The second best code is someone else's code that they wrote and maintained but you could read. And the third best code is anything else, so just try not to write code. <laughs> um, yeah, you still have to own your operations and your reliability. Um, I get really amused at all these serverless parties where all they talk about is state services, because <laughs> any jackass can run a stateless service. <laughs> um, if you actually want to like, run and scale databases, things get hard. Uh, deployment. Reasoning about all the contracts that other people are providing you. Like if you've moved from a microservices architecture inside your own org, and then you're moving to like a serverless, um, except now nobody's telling you what contracts they're trying to serve you, that's cool. Um, you can be down a bit, but you know. Uh, security and vendor lock-in. Um, release and deploy processes. <laughs> Who here is running ECS or Lambda? Seriously, what the fuck are all the rest of you doing? I have so many questions. Uh, that can be, that can, that's later. Okay, fine. Um, yeah, uh, this, this stuff is really immature, to say the least. But here's how the story usually goes. Uh, tell you a little bedtime story. That's 7 a.m. in the morning. <laughs> I'm a software engineer. And if you start out thinking like Rainbow Dash here, you're going to have a bad time because the marketing promises that anyone tells you, um, like we told people at Parse, like I've just seen how that plays out. And the thing is that it's not that you have no ops, right? It's that your ops team is now Google SREs or AWS operations. That's awesome. My hardware engineering team are on in AWS, and I have never met them, and I can pretend that they don't exist, and it's amazing. But they do exist, right? And every other year or so, there's some abstract, weird hardware bug that I have to really dig into to figure out. Like, I can't forget that it's there. 
And this is a world where, counterintuitively, application engineers have to be way better at operations and architecture and performance than they had to be when they had an embedded dedicated ops team sitting right next to them who was getting paged and fixing their shit in the middle of the night. <laughs> um, like, the second slide of the three slides story is, is the very sad moment when Rainbow Dash is like, am I full table scanning? Hmm, so complicated. What's happening under the covers? What Rainbow Dash right now is encountering uh, operations, which is why Rainbow Dash needs a drink. <laughs> Poor little pony. Um, raise your hand if you think of someone who, if you think of yourself as someone who does operations work. Nice. Oh, you, you kids are so much better than the ones in New York. <laughs> this is like a weirdly loaded term these days. Um, people keep talking about it as something that they need to get rid of. Um, I'm so happy that so many of you raised your hands because I think everyone should be raising their hands because operations, like at any sort of macro level, has nothing to do with software engineering or in anything in general. It's just how you get stuff done. Are you getting things done? Well, that's nice. Then you're doing some operations. Operations is like the combined sum of your skills and your knowledges and your knowledge is your knowledge, your best practices, and your habits, whether they're explicit or implicit, around shipping quality systems and software. Um, everybody, I think, in an organization that builds things participates in this to some extent, from like your tech support, um, your office manager, your CEO. Um, if things are broken and they have an impact, either on breaking them or fixing them, like that's kind of priority one for most people. And I'm not saying that it's done well, I'm not even saying that it needs to be done well. Like, let's be clear. Like, I'm not saying that everyone needs four or five nines. Um, technology, more than most of us like to admit, is mostly irrelevant to success in business. I just came from Facebook. Who uses PHP? I rest my case. So if you tell me your company doesn't do po any ops, I'm just going to say you don't have any customers or software or anybody who cares about your product. Either that, or you are systematically devaluing an entire discipline of skills and processes that actually produce high quality software and systems. Um, and so many of the companies out there that I've seen be most vocal and aggressive in their disdain for operations have ended up hiring three times as many software engineers to SSH into hosts one by one and do things really badly, which is fine. You do you. But like by establishing that precedent out loud, they're just saying very vocally, this, oper this organization does not care about quality operations. So why would any good ops person want to go work there? I don't. Like in general, you just, you don't make a thing better by ignoring that it exists, right? You make a thing better by naming it, uh, working on improving it. And I mean, okay, come on. I think that no devs, we can all agree, is just the next logical progression of this because how hard can it be to glue together a few APIs with some glue code? Like, any idiot can do this. <laughs> yeah, I just like an ego. So when we talk about operations engineering and how it applies to everyone in this room, like, this is what I think of when I think of core competencies. Um... And to me, these don't seem optional for a good product that is growing. Um, these are table stakes, I think. Um, and I think that software engineers, I've said this five times, I'm only gonna say it five more times. I'm only gonna say it until people start listening. <laughs> um, and it's not even about the quality of your service. It's about um, minimizing the technical debt as you grow and the pain that you inflict on your humans, um, which directly translate into your ability to hire and recruit. Everybody out there trying so hard and failing to recruit amazing engineers, um, we are gossipy little shits. Like, we talk to each other behind the scenes constantly. And if you're working someplace that doesn't respect your people's time, that wakes them up in the middle of the night, that is not fun to work on, like, like when we decided we had to rewrite the API at, at Parse, like, we didn't take this, um, lightly, and we chose Golang over C++ because we're like, hmm, which language are we going to be able to recruit engineers to come work with us on? Well, it's not going to be C++. Totally legit. I think that people like tend to push this into like the fuzzy 
a corner or something, but your ability to recruit and hire and retain engineers is incredibly key to your, ser to, to your success. So back to serverless. Um, what does this mean, a serverless world? Um, how are the rules kind of shifting? How do we um, apply these principles? Um, well, I think we always have to start off any technical conversation with the question, um, what's, what's your mission? Right, because every single question that comes after that has to flow from that answer. And your mission is not building software, ever. Um, writing software may be how you get there, but it's not your mission. Like maybe your mission is helping people get healthcare, or I don't know, building a great social gaming experience, making the world more open and connected, <laughs> whatever. Um, if you aren't clear on what your mission is, and if your mission is writing a database, that's just, just another level of abstraction, right? Or, you know, if you're, if you're MongoDB, like your mission is not writing a database, it's, you know, m document databases and stuff. Um, and people might be like, isn't this business stuff? I'm an engineer, why should I care? Well, it's because you can be the best engineer in the world, and if you're building the wrong thing, then you're not the best en engineer in the world. You're actually like a drag to your org. You can be completely ineffective or even dangerous if you don't understand what your mission is. Um, what are your core business differentiators? Again, why should you care? Uh, because this just means what are you doing that's new and critical and exciting and different that creates your competitive edge, that makes you stay alive. Um, and why, the reason I ask is because these are the things that you may never be able to outsource. If you can outsource it, then why do you exist? <clears throat> um, what value are you adding? You should know these things and own them. Because, fact, you can pay people to do work for you. You cannot really pay them to care. Um, you can't pay them to care as viscerally about your mission as you do. Uh, you can pay them to get, give you an SLA. Doesn't mean they're going to meet it. Uh, you can pay them to give you an SLA, but if you are 100,000th on the list of customers that they care about, like if I have never cracked into the top, into the top thousand of AWS customers. I'm quite certain of that fact. I'm very realistic. When US East One goes down, I'm not one of the top five that gets you know hand you know mistakenly whatever brought up. Um, outsourcing is a very transactional relationship, and I love transactional relationships. I don't want to have like a deep personal relationship with my grocer or my postman. I will outsource the shit out of this. Um, but the core pieces that determine whether my startup succeeds or fail, like for us, it's storage engine. You know, we had to write our own column, st column store. And believe me, after as many years of being a deep DBA as I, as I have, I did not take that lightly. <laughs> um, so a few tips for making good decisions when outsourcing or serverlessing, as the kids say. <laughs> um, think realistically about what has to be in your critical path and own it and keep that list as short as possible. Uh, if you're outsourcing, take the time to understand what's under the hood. So at Parse, million apps, right? Running on MongoDB. The people who took five minutes to understand what that might mean for their object model were in a much happier world than the people who didn't. You know, the people who are writing, who are storing their game states in our database and just automatically saving the entire blob on every single key press, they were not happy campers. And I did not go out of my way to make them happy. <laughs> I was like, put that in an S3 blob, abuse someone else. <laughs> um, don't assume that it will necessarily be better than what you could build or that it will take less time to debug for someone else to, to build it for you. It will probably save you time in the long run to outsource, but you're going to sacrifice some quality of service and visibility and control. Um, you're still on the hook for the results, right? It's really tacky when a provider goes down and you see other people posting postmortems and blaming them and like calling them out. I find that just unacceptable. Look, it's still up to you. Um, just own it. <laughs> Your users don't care. Your users don't care if you're down because of an obscure like raft consensus algorithm bug, or if like AWS is down, or even if you aren't technically down, you're just down for them because of something that they did. They really don't care. They will still blame you when they should. Um, 
have you guys read the uh, blog post of Dan McKinley's on choosing boring technology and spending your innovation tokens? Oh my God, go bookmark that. It's one of my favorite pieces ever. He talks about how, you know, all right, so he's from Etsy. So they were able to use a lot of boring technology, whereas people who are running newer stuff can't necessarily. But he's like, you have innovation tokens if you're a startup. Choose where to spend them wisely. You probably don't want to spend one of your innovation tokens on you know, your continuous integration setup, right? Uh, a lot of serverless technology is going to cost you innovation tokens and be a big energy sink, so only do it when it's necessary. Um, you're going to have less visibility. Where's my, there we go. You can't fix it yourself, right? Lambda's down. Well, just gonna sit here and wait for the yellow dot to turn green. Well, no, I'm gonna sit here and wait for the green dot to turn yellow in an hour. And then uh, another hour after it's fixed, it will turn back to green. Oh, God. Um, yeah, so they may not tell you when it's done. You definitely can't fix it. Um, it will protect itself at your own expense. Uh, <laughs> the prime directive of any platform is to care for its own health above any individual user. You will get throttled. You will get shut down. Uh, you will submit request to Lambda and get back the error string that says, error, root partition full. <laughs> Wait, I'm sorry. I mean, there's no servers under there. <laughs> uh, flexibility. It's way harder to build airtight, reliable services if you sharply limit what people are allowed to do with it. DynamoDB is a great example of this. It's great at what it does, and it's really, really limited on purpose. If you play by the rules and stay in your lane, it will be pretty reliable, but you've sacrificed a lot of flexibility. Um, it's good to know, what is the co-tenancy model? Uh, for Heroku, right? The, the dinos, they're pretty autonomous. At Parse, this was not true. Um, you would want to ask, how many people are on my shard? This is more common than not. Uh, ev eventually, if you are a user, you're going to have some weird, unexplained performance problems, and it's going to be traceable to someone else. It's really annoying. Um, but the better of a mental model that you have, the better you can um, predict how much chaos is going to infect your systems. Consider vendor lock-in early. Now, I, I hesitate to bring up too much here, because there are so many things about the future that you can try and predict and account for, and it's mostly a waste of time because most companies and startups fail, and yours and mine probably will too, and not because of this. But still, they bring me, they, they bring me so that I will cheer everybody up. <laughs> yeah, um, how confident are you that the service will be around in a year or three years? Have you heard of parts.com? Motherfuckers. <laughs> um, automated status page. Um, AWS being the exception, automated status pages um, are usually a really good signal of confidence. Um, people who have enough trust in their own system when something is erroring. Um, yeah, AWS is an exception. It's kind of weird because it seems like they would do this. Uh, data. Oh, anybody here who, uh, DBAs? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, your data is your responsibility, too. This is where stuff actually gets really, really serious and really scary. I'm um, interesting. If you ever get bored and you're just like, I'm going to rage quit and go to the desert and not do technology, just go and do, be a DBA. It's basically the same thing. <laughs> Except you still get paid a lot of money. <laughs> um, your data is your responsibility, too. And um, I am so scared of using any databases as a service. Hmm. Anyway, um, backups. Ask about offsite backups. Ask about failover between whatever hardware networking model they're using, if it's regions or um, knowing what the query planner looks like is incredibly helpful. I always wonder how much. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. I feel like I want to want to run experiments in this room. Well, next time. Uh, your query performance is going to be entirely dependent on the underlying data structures and data stores. Um, queries are going to run very differently um, if you're using a columnar store versus you know, a row-based store versus a document database or you know, Cassandra. Um, if you're in charge of your own data, 
Well, whether you're in charge of it or not, you should assume that you are. Always take offsite backups of your provider. Um, and test restores, because data is like you know Schrodinger's data. You know, if you aren't testing the restores in an automated way every week, it's, you should assume it doesn't exist. And another subject that deserves like two or three hours is instrumentation. Um, this is what my startup is all about, so I'm full of thoughts, which I will not go into. But like in someone else's playground, you can't tail a log. Uh, you can't S-trace a file uh, or a PID. You can't add a metric. Uh, you can't run GDB or NetStat or IP route. Like just thinking about having this loss of control just like makes me start hyperventilating. Um, you have to instrument your app. Like this stuff's gonna happen, and if you haven't done this in advance, you're just going, it's a black box, and that's terrifying. And don't put all of your eggs in one basket. Like, don't rely on the same provider to instrument and monitor as is serving your stuff. Or at least, you know, these, these little, you know, when you're paying for these piddly ass providers, myself being one of them, that's not terribly derogatory, um, like, they're like, you know, 100 bucks a month. Do two. <laughs> or pay to have two accounts so that they, you know, are syncing the data somewhere else. Because it's, it's so frustrating when. Uh, you can't tell if your stuff is down because your stuff is down. <laughs> At the very least, like have an external ping that lets you know. Uh, Pingdom is great for this, right? Um, yeah, some examples of questions that your instrumentation should empower you to answer instantly. Uh, your 99th percentile latency is up uh, 50% now versus yesterday at the same time. Why? How would you know? Um, how quickly could you tell what happened? If it was one application or one customer of yours, or all of the ones on a particular shard or using a particular feature? Um, if a user writes in and says that your service is down and you're fairly certain it's not because you're using it yourself, how can you tell what the differences are in your experience? How, how, do you, need, you need the ability to quickly tell whether they're a dumbass or not. Because make no mistake, half the time that software engineers write in and say that your shit is down, they didn't turn on their Wi-Fi. <laughs> um, and you're never done cultivating and tuning your alerts, right? This is a lifelong, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but it's true. This is a lifelong endeavor. Um, you shouldn't think of it as a thing that you build and then you walk away from. It's something that you should be in every day. Like this is how you know the what you're building and what you're engineering is good and getting better or not worse. Like this should feel like an extension of your IDE, all of your instrumentation and observability. It's not something that an ops team looks at. It's something that you look at while you're writing code. The best software engineers that I, this is like almost a universal rule. The best software engineers that I've worked with are the ones who spend the most time in stuff that's not their editor. And if that sounds familiar, and yeah, sure, I have some bias, but whatever. Um, this, is, um, this is doing ops for your app, and you should be good at it, and you should be proud of it. You know, it's the fundamentals of designing and maintaining a quality service on the internet, even with all of these glorious abstractions. Um, and teams that are good at this don't happen by accident. How many managers here? Ha ha, sweet. It'll infect you. Um, it takes caring and cultivating, right? And, um, and I said this before, I want to stress it. Your mission statement, if it doesn't include high quality, I'm not saying that is a bad thing. If, the, if in the top five things that are going to make or break your business, like um, being up a lot isn't one of them, it's very expensive to try and be up most of the time. Don't do it. Um, it's not trivial. <laughs> uh, and there are a lot of services that can be down, you know, 1% of every day, and that's a lot. Uh, but, but if you, and if, and if you're, <laughs> all right, but if you're writing the Kim Kardashian game, that's not striking a nerve, okay, yeah, it's a thing in America. Kim Kardashian, little player games where she goes shopping and plays like celebrity stuff. If you're, if you're writing disposable iOS games or Kim Kardashian games, just go jump off the pier, I don't care, with my blessing. <laughs> Um, but if you care about quality services, then you actually, what you actually care about is supporting your engineers in growing new muscles and changing your processes and your culture to reflect your values. Uh, I'm about out of time. It's cool. I only have a couple slides left. Um, on an individual level, 
uh, you emphasize these things, instrumentation and debuggability. When you're doing a code review, look for the metric. How do I know if this is working or not? Um, put software engineers on call. I think that one of the most important shifts that we're undergoing in the industry right now is the locus of on-call energy moving from operations engineers to software engineers, thank you, who are on call for their own stuff. And infrastructure engineers are becoming much more of a specialist consultant. I will help you figure out how to make your own services. Because the corollary to be on call for your own services is make on-call not suck. Like you can't expect everyone to be on call all the time if it's terrible. And ops has been complicit in this. Like we have not valued our own time for a long time, and it's given on call a really bad name. And you know, believe me, I'm lecturing my kids over on the other side too. Um, but it makes you de develop better systems um, when you get faster feedback. You know, when your feedback loops are tight, um, when they're getting paged, when they push push out bad code. Um, on a team level or company level, uh, you can signal what you value um, by asking questions in interviews. You know, um, ask people if they're willing to be on call. Ask them some basic stuff about operations. It doesn't mean they have to know the answers, but you've signaled from the very beginning that you care about it, and it's the thing that they're expected to level up on. I mean, it's not the like code reviews, right? They're a drag, but you do them. Got to eat your Wheaties. Um, and when it comes time to promote and uh, give bonuses, um, never promote someone to senior software engineer if they are a net negative when it comes to operational impact, period. Um, it takes more work to identify and praise the invisible uh, operations type of engineering, but it's worth it. Everybody praises the people who, sh who ship shiny features. Everybody's like, yay, feature, so cool. Um, it's your responsibility as a technical leader, not just managers. Like, if you're a senior engineer, you have at least as much weight. Like, your voice praising people um, has just as much weight as any manager's. Um, work to identify and acknowledge people who are doing the work that is more unsung. Yeah. Um, and just fundamentally, just don't, <clears throat> don't treat it like it's optional. Like it's 2016, uh, DevOps happened. Uh, people have been lecturing ops engineers for what, eight years now? Get better at software engineering, get better at coding, write tests, good, thank you, it's awesome. It's been so good for us. But like, it's time for the shoe to flip a little bit. It's time for software engineers to get the message that uh, this goes both ways. You have to be responsible for your services too. The only way this is a real true partnership is if we, we both know um, how to do the relevant parts of each other's jobs. Even iOS and Android engineers, like, sorry, mobile apps, MongoDB queries, it's still a query under the hood. You're still bound by the speed of light. <laughs> and the reason that this matters is not because I want to be a drag and lecture people, well, I do, but that's separate. It's because like, the cost and pain of writing a piece of software up front is like you can round it down to zero compared to the cost of maintaining, just the amortized cost of maintaining it over time. It's so expensive. Like, orders of magnitude more expensive to maintain something that was written poorly uh, than something that was written by someone who just took a few minutes to think, to ask someone, hmm, what does this query look like? Hmm, how do we monitor this? How do we know if it's done? In conclusion, <clears throat> let's talk about the future. It's happening, it's a good thing. It is not uniformly mature. That's my polite way of putting it. Uh, if you choose this model at this point, you're choosing to spend innovation tokens on this. Uh, remember what I said about Lambda? I've been having fun with Lambda. Uh, the future is not stable. Do not listen to the marketing. <laughs> um, and the other reason this matters is because the era of everyone having these dedicated in-house operations teams who act as the cannon fodder for your Software engineering teams is winding down. Um, people are really starting to wake up to the fact that software quality improves when engineers take responsibility for it and are directly exposed the, to the consequences. And the operations engineers are better served as domain experts on things like infrastructure and storage and instrumentation and resiliency. Um, this is one of those annoying but useful myths 
Uh, there's a long list of myths uh, that I hate. Another one is the full stack developer. Anytime somebody asks you that, I'm like, great, how'd you design your chip? <laughs> <laughs> like, it's annoying and it's misleading, but it, it addresses this real driving need, right? Outsourcing is becoming the norm. It's great. I never, I haven't gotten to drive to a, um, to a colo and push the button on a MySQL primary um, since, uh, uh, since George Bush was president. Things get better in more ways than one. Um, engineering cycles are always going to be the scarcest resource that you have, always. Uh, and this empowers everyone to focus on their hardest core problem. I believe in this future, right? I just co-founded a company to like, deal with this vision of the future. That's so much I believe in it, which actually, come to think of it, may be a sign that it's wrong. <laughs> I tend to not be up on the marketing, whatever. Um, but you get to rent the world's best talent. I get to rent the world's best hardware engineers, right? You got to rent, those of two lovely people who use Parse, uh, got to rent the world's best MongoDB engineering. God, the more I say, the worse it sounds. Um, <laughs> use all, all I'm trying to say is, like, use your tools um, to get better at owning services, um, because no matter how many abstraction layers we add, um, these skills are going to be more and more valued and more and more expected, and your users have higher and higher expectations of you. And that's what your mission is all about. And nobody but you has the unique ability, right, to think holistically about your mission. Um, so own it. And do it. And uh, have fun. That's it. Thanks. We've, uh